Hello, everyone. It's really nice to see you here. And uh, a nice rainy Saturday afternoon to be uh, hearing a very special meeting. In the heart of the library, it's so important for us to gather and hear and consider new ideas. I, for instance, now know that it's better to flick than swat a, ma a wasp. That gulls are really good daddies. That drop crotch pruning is better for trees than topping. That more and more of our sugar maples are too weak to produce anthocyanins, hence more orange than red. And that black may be the new orange for maples. And that mallards are the Chevy and Paulas of ducks. And from whom have I learned these fascinating factoids, as well as enhanced understanding of the nuanced interconnections that characterize the web of life of which we are a part, about which we are asked to become more aware? From this gentleman, Paul Hetzler, naturalist and arborist who writes provocative, compelling, humorous, profoundly relevant essays. essays. Essays which simultaneously entertain and astonish us and invite us to realign ourselves with the miraculous world they reveal. Bring it on, Paul. <laughs> ooh, ooh, ooh. Wow, Elza, thank you for that, uh, yeah, that, that amazing intro. Um, and, and thank uh, you and uh, also Ruth for uh, inviting me here and for organizing this. Um, and, and thank you guys, yeah, for, for coming out. And, uh, I probably, uh, I know some of you, and, but not uh, most of you not. Um, it'd be great to get to know people better. <laughs> so and, uh, so I'll, I'll start by reading from... Um, head of the class, I guess, so kind of inspired by a plasmodial slime mold. No, okay. So, yeah, I mean, we humans, we think we're so, you know, amazingly intelligent, and, um, you know, here we have, you know, monumental feats like the Colosseum and, you know, space travel, nerve gas, oceans filled with plastic, you know, all these things that no other animals can do. And so, no wonder we think we're great. Um, so, uh, smart as a slime mold, when, when the topic of animal intelligence comes up, we might argue whether a crow or a parrot is the cleverer, or if dolphins are smarter than manatees. Seldom do we ascribe smarts to life forms such as insects, uh, plants, or especially fungi. And it is rare indeed that we question our intellectual primacy among animals. It is true that no other species can point to monumental achievements like acid rain and atomic weapons. <laughs> that doesn't mean that other species are bird-brained, metaphorically speaking, of course. It makes sense that elephants and whales are smart, given the size of their heads. Depending on species, whale brains weigh between five and eight kilograms, and Dumbo's cranium would tip the scale at around five kilograms. Compared to them, our 1.3, give or take, kilogram brains are small potatoes. What sets mammal brains apart from these other classes of animal is the uh, neocortex, so the outer most part of our brain that is responsible for higher functions, like language and abstract thinking. But size is not the only thing that counts. Our neocortices, unlike those of most animals, are highly convoluted. So we all know what that means. It means that we make things way more complicated than necessary. So, well, it also means that there's 
a lot more real estate uh, per area. Uh, so if you were to, um, a lot of acreage can fit into a small space if it's nothing but valleys and mountains. Imagine if Alberta was a rug and you kind of scrunched it up to the size of Prince Edward Island, it would still have the same large surface area, but it would fit in a smaller area. I'm not suggesting this, by the way, at all. Um, so this greater surface area per unit volume is what equates uh, to more processing power than a less highly folded brain. The ability to make and use tools and to carry them for future use is one of the widely accepted indications of intelligence. In the past, it was thought that only humans and our close ape relatives used tools. So we know that we've seen gorillas uh, using spears to, to uh, spear fish, um, uh, sticks, well not spears, but uh, sticks to spear fish and um, have observed gorillas making a, a little log uh, uh, bridge over a, over a little uh, gully. Um, so uh, we don't give them much credit uh, unless they, maybe they charge toll for that bridge and we think they're pretty great. Um, only just recently has the intelligence of others of cephalopods like cuttlefish, squid, and octopodes, which I'm told is the actual, the correct plural, but octopuses is better. So. Squid and octopuses have uh, been documented. Octopuses have been observed foraging for discarded coconut shells. They use them to build little sea castles of sorts in which to hide from their enemies. If their ability with tools progresses, uh, I bet they, they could knit an awesome sweater in no time. <laughs> All right. Uh, birds also use tools. Crows, for example, will use a stick to poke at bugs that they cannot otherwise reach. An insect will bite the stick, the crow pulls it out, and voila. A little uh, hors d'oeuvre on a toothpick. Perfect. Um, so uh, humans always assumed birds were not very smart, you know, the term bird brain, because their brains weigh but a few grams. They range from the size of maybe a pea to about walnut size. Well, it turns out we humans have had to eat crow because bird brains are far more neuron dense than mammal brains. It's like we are comparing our great big vacuum tube brain from the 1950s, people remember those, I'd wait till they warm up, um, to a little microchip bird brain. We think ours is better, it's bigger. No, the birds have a microchip. So, um, in fact, birds test on par with primates for intelligence. So we know that honeybees use a sort of interpretive bee dance to communicate with each other as to the location of flowers and um, picnickers. Our native bumblebees seem to have one up on them. I should say bumblebee species in general. In 2016, researchers at Queen Mary University of London, England, found that bumblebees learned within minutes how to roll a tiny ball into a tiny hole to get a tiny sugar water reward. <laughs> wow, I assume the researchers are now busy with bumblebee golf tournaments. <laughs> so, yeah, so, okay, Even good. So we'll, we'll kind of hit a um, more, uh, I don't know if it's somber or a, a different note with this one. So this is from my first book, Shady Characters. Uh, and this is written pre-pandemic, like way, yeah, 2015 or so. Uh, it didn't really see this kind of a situation being uh, applicable, but it, but it is. Uh, I heard an interview with um, uh, uh, Feist, um, Leslie Feist, uh, people know who, who that is, recording artist, uh, and it was really remarkable. So she talked about, she um, apparently had her first child right at just weeks before the, the, the first pandemic uh, restrictions began. So she's had sort of, it's talked about a double quarantine, you know. And um, so she was talking about this in terms of a, of a crucible for all of us, like, like the pandemic has been kind of a crucible. And um, talking about feeling incinerated, that was pretty, pretty, that's uh, pretty um, severe there. But she said words to the effect that, I, you know, um, 
have them exactly, but uh, you know that the person that we're coming out to, uh, of this uh, uh, crucible, the person that we come out as is, is generally someone that we are much uh, happier to have around um, for the going forward. You know, it, it's like, yeah, yeah, this misery is going to do you a lot of good, right? <laughs> don't tell anyone that. So it's called self-help and soup. We commonly refer to difficult times, periods of grief or anguish, in terms of dissolution. A person might go to pieces, fall apart, dissolve in tears, or have a meltdown. This latter meltdown can describe anything from a childhood tantrum to a coworker who loses composure due to stress. Meltdowns are usually more short-lived. Short Breakdowns last longer. Weeks, months, maybe years in some cases. People in the state of what they call breakdown, they generally aren't able to function very well where they used to function. Uh, nearly all who have had breakdowns recover, almost everyone, and it is not unusual afterward for them to be changed. They have a new outlook. Maybe they left an abusive relationship. Maybe they realized that they, they, did, they wanted a different career path. So oftentimes, as a result of surviving a very dark period, an individual will shape their life to better suit them and report being more satisfied with life than before. In order to make the dramatic leap from glorified maggot, this isn't people now, okay, <laughs> to graceful flying machines, a caterpillar has a complete breakdown, during which it has a meltdown, but a literal one. So caterpillars, of course, are the juvenile stages of moths or caterpillars. And most are stubby, cigar-shaped, soft-body, crawly things, sometimes with hair, sometimes not. And they somehow, from that state, become gossamer-winged wonders. We know they enter a pupil phase to switch their costumes. But until recently, we knew more about what went on inside Clark Kent's phone booth than what happened during pupation. <laughs> but thanks to electron micrography, and I'm sure some other fancy science stuff, <laughs> we now know a tiny bit more. Some caterpillars produce silk. I guess we all can think of ones that we don't want to think of there, the uh, LDD or, or formerly known as gypsy moths, right? The, the silken uh, cocoons. But uh, our monarch butterfly makes beautiful, just the, the most uh, uh, exquisite chrysalis, right? Oh, you can kind of see through them. They're, uh, they're um, kind of ex accented with gold. So, wow. So, for example, the monarch make a chrysalis, a pupil case with a membranous skin around it. Once housing is settled, the hard part begins. Ensconced in its regal gold-flecked chrysalis, the cute, stripy chub of a monarch caterpillar releases enzymes which dissolve its body. All of it. For a time, that elegant chrysalis is full of nothing but green caterpillar soup. By the time the pupil chamber unzips and an adult monarch emerges from its chrysalis to rub its bleary eyes, not one drop of caterpillar soup remains. So, caterpillar soup, anyone? <laughs> um, I, I'm, I, I'm sure that all of you share my fascination with process, and I kind of was hoping that, Paul, you could give us a little bit of a, of a, a peek at what you were like when you were a boy and how this <laughs> stupendous curiosity and uh, far-reaching brain of yours evolved. Let us know. Let us know the stages. <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, so I, I started writing. Um, oh, well, uh, I worked uh, at one point. So I'm from the States. Uh, I'm not embarrassed to admit it, right? So, <laughs> um, but uh, Mahilin and I met uh, in uh, Dumil Says 2016. So, uh, voila. Uh, I, I love my farm down there. I love her more, and I'm happy. <laughs> happy to be here. Okay. 
All right, but so uh, I worked for uh, the New York State uh, Environmental um, Conservation Department in, in, um, in uh, what they call environmental quality, pollution remediation and stuff. <clears throat> and we had to write these little reports every month and everyone hated to say, you know, and I just started having fun with them to the point where other departments were passing them around, but then the, the regional um, division, the regional uh, head of the, of the uh, Region 5 it was, uh, at Arondex, uh, got wind of it and <laughs> told me to stop because, oh, these are public record and you can't, okay, okay. Oh. Uh, it wasn't very long after that that, um, okay, and so the, the um, aforementioned divorce happened and uh, a geographic change. So I moved from the southern Adirondacks into the St. Lawrence Valley and that's, uh, I got a job with Cornell Extension uh, as an educator, as a you know, community educator. And then um, I was asked, it was part of my job, no, you have to write uh, for the newspapers, Ho hopefully once a month, but you can write more often if you want. We, you know, they, I was like, I have to, oh my God. <laughs> so <laughs> like, yeah, so I, I mainly wrote about trees, because I, I was a, kind of a, the certified arborist was my first thing, even before uh, you know, getting a job with, with New York State. Um, and yeah, so but then it kind of, you know, always trees and then it branched out from there, so to speak. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I, I just found, yeah, it, the, the message is a lot, you know, easier to digest, if you will. I, I was, my goal is to write for people that either are ambivalent about a subject or, or generally find it distasteful, maybe, they, you know, so at least make something, um, you know, I don't know if that even answered your question. You want to know what I was like as a kid. No, I had to sit in the corner. <laughs> no. How you evolved? How evolved? They evolved. Okay, well, it's kind of personal, the evolution part of it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, sorry. I have something I want to say. I will submit that um, getting to know nature better and crawling around and lifting rocks and wondering and feeling it feeling connected is going to save all of our lives. Okay. Amen. Wow. Well said. That was a wow. Amen. You've you inspired me. Oh, is that it? I think you were already inspired. But, uh, okay, so I'm just getting up to get my book. So.